firing well. I right, think the attainment pressure looks good. Time right now. Water towers can fly! Yes! go down phenomenal. Fighting down for your feet off. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. All right, folks. You know the drill. <laughs> we are live once again. The jumping bar tells me that you should be able to hear me, but I'd rather uh, you confirm for me. Let me know. Can you hear me? John Galloway, NASA Spaceflight here. It is NASA Spaceflight Live, our weekly show that cuts every Saturday in half if you're a member of the NASA Spaceflight team. <laughs> Here we are. Let me know in chat that we are five by five and we will get this party started. Yes, you can tell I got chat on this monitor because I'm get a crick in my neck turning all the way over here. But let's go ahead and get started with today's live show. This is our talk show that we do just about every week um, to talk about what's going on. And with me, I've got a couple names that will not be new to you if you've been around our streams before. Let's start off. Which way did I point? This side, Chris Gabhard. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. How about yourself, Das? I am hanging in there. How's that sound? Uh, <laughs> you know how it goes. <laughs> Chris is, of course, the assistant managing editor for NASA Spaceflight. You've seen him on this show. You've heard from him on many of our streams. You've also probably read his articles um, that he either writes himself or manages uh, for NASA Spaceflight. But Chris, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. All right. And then in this corner, did I do it right? Yes, I did it right. Uh, Jack Byer. Jack, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good. Everything is, uh, you know, just another day in paradise. So I'm hanging out, ready to have just some enough. fun on our weekly NASA Spaceflight Live show. Good deal. Jack is, do we do we have an official title for Jack? Jack just does everything. Um, uh, all Jack sorts of right things. now is a jack of all trades, I would say. Um, <laughs> ha ha ha. <laughs> and a master of about half of them uh, when you start to count his videography and the, the shots that he does for the live streams and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the editing he does for the daily videos. Jack, thank you so much for joining us. Always a good time, right? Yeah, buddy. All right. <laughs> Well, we have a lot of stuff to talk about today, so I'll do the housekeeping first. Uh, this is our live show, so while we're going through this, we encourage you to discuss what we're talking about live in chat. You can see it over there on whichever side it is on your screen. I don't know where you put it, um, but you can talk in chat. And while we're discussing topics, you can also ask us questions. If you have a question for us, tag us at NASA Spaceflight. If it's relevant to what we're talking about at the time, there's a chance that we may get a chance to, to actually bring your question up. No way we always get to all the questions but we do have some software. Uh, if you ask us a question that has nothing to do with the topic that we're talking about, expect that we probably won't get to that. Like if you ask, how does the sun work? And we're talking about Falcon Heavy. <laughs> Not a lot of commonality between those two topics, unless Falcon Heavy is launching at night, in which case it looks like a sun, but whatever, that's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> it's, it's true, right, Chris? It is true. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no but sorry. My, my, my joke is usually like rockets launch at night when they have to hide things from the sun. They have to hide <laughs> things from the sun, like those solar landing missions and stuff that uh, yes. we're known to deal with. Uh, anyways, a lot of cool topics today that we're going to be talking about. Uh, we know that there's big news with Falcon Heavy that has happened. So we'll be talking about Falcon Heavy and Europa Clipper. New Shepard also did a launch this week. This week was it really this. Yeah, it was, yeah. Really... God, it was four days flies. ago. <laughs> yep. Time flies. Uh, New Shepard was launching, launched successfully. We'll talk about that. Uh, we've got the Russian module headed up to the space station and a little bit of speed bumps that they've hit there. Still tracking towards hopefully making up to the station. Rocket mm -hmm. Lab talking about what happened with some past missions. OFT2, Boca Chica, Starship, all the different things that we always cover will be, well, covering today. Where are we starting, y'all? What's the plan? I believe we're going to start with uh, everyone's favorite interplanetary probe to Jupiter, Europa Clipper, because uh, it had some big news. Uh, arguably, I, I, I would say, I, I don't know if you agree with me on this, Jack, I think that was one of the worst kept secrets um, yep. <laughs> in terms no, of I, what launch. I would agree with that. It seemed like kind of the obvious thing that was going to happen was it should be launched on Falcon Heavy, and I don't want to just completely cut you off at the chase there but it just i'm so happy I'm, I, it just makes me happy because sometimes 
the universe kind of like gets you down and you're like, why do things have to be the way they are? And sometimes <laughs> things work out in a logical way, the way they should. And this is one of those cases where uh, it made logical sense from a budgetary standpoint to launch it on Falcon Heavy and it's going to be launched on Falcon Heavy. Yeah, indeed. Um, you know, you you mentioned the budgetary aspect of it too, um, which I, which I, I have a few facts and figures here that we uh, that I think some folks would be very interesting because there is the overall question of uh, since it got unshackled from SLS, how much money does this? save um and you know it, you can kind of look at it in a couple different ways if you, if you look at it just from the rocket perspective the sls block 1b which this would have been going on basically with the exploration upper stage um originally then the icps when that might not have been ready you know it was it was basically around 883 million dollars for just the rocket um so 178 million for the Falcon Heavy is a significant cost savings just from the rocket side of things. But there there are there are some other things to, to factor in there because you know when you talk about launching this mission in SLS is very low flight rate where it very likely could have been the only SLS that year. Yep. Um it, there's one there's the 1 billion dollar overhead for the entire program that sort of that funding has to start over again at the top of the year and all the maintenance and stuff that has to go on at the launch facilities. I, I mean, so you were act and plus if this would actually have gone with an exploration upper stage, which was kind of the sticking point when that got delayed and got it down to the ICPS, uh, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage from ULA, you know, you could have had an extra billion dollars in there because if you had to go on an SLS block one B, then you have to build a new mobile launcher. And that's going to cost them about a billion dollars. So that mission was going to roughly run NASA if it was totally in-house for the launch services, probably about two to three billion dollars versus Oof. contracting out a launch service with SpaceX for a contract price of 178 million. Now, of course, NASA scientists and some of the salaries that would have been included in the cost of Europa Clipper obviously have to be included into the agency cost because of NASA employees. But like removing the ground infrastructure element and, and the cost of that rocket really, really, really saved a lot of money here. That's fantastic. And, and, you, and you mentioned, oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, and, and like Falcon Heavy, when when you really took away the exploration upper stage element of it, and and we're need going to need to go on the the block one with the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. At that point, I mean, yeah, there was a little bit of a performance boost by going on an SLS, but nothing that Falcon Heavy couldn't you know be right there behind. Yeah, and you mentioned the flight rate aspect of it too. If SLS is going to be launching Artemis crews. You want to, you know, free up SLS to to have enough rockets to launch enough Artemis crews that we can get that program done in a timely fashion. And uh, if, if SLS flies what twice a year at max, or what was the what's the what's the I believe, something like I, that, right? Yeah, I think the surge is like a capability to do two a year, but then the next year has to be one. So basically three in two years is the surge last year. Yeah, I heard. and if, if one of those is Europa Clipper, that's not an Artemis mission. And so uh, that's another aspect of it, you know, beyond the in, enormous, insane cost savings that is, you know, really a, a cool part of it because, hey, I, I want to see the Artemis program work out and uh, and put boots up back on the moon, like sign me up for that. So, yeah. yeah. So to clarify, Three flights in two years, a higher flight rate than Falcon Heavy. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you take its total operational time, I'd say Sorry. yes. Uh, all the... <laughs> I had to do it. I had to no, do no, it. No, 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 no. It's, 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 it's a good point because, you know, Fal we, we, this is exciting for, for the launch vehicle, but you do raise a good point, Doss, right? I mean, the last time the Falcon Heavy flew was STP-2 in June of 2019. Um, and then its missions in 2020 uh, just kept getting pushed um, because the payloads weren't weren't there for it yet. Um, and we've seen that sort of continual slippage now, um, sort of, you know, so, sort of continuing to ricochet with the two missions that are up there. But it does actually have a rather healthy manifest for a heavy lift vehicle like yep. that. Not that you would guess it <laughs> from uh, <laughs> uh, from the fact that we're three years in and have only had three flights of it. Yes. Three flights. <laughs> yeah. And, and However, it thing... didn't manage to do those three flights like within 14 months. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, did one of them count? Because one of them was a, an experiment. I, I'm I'm just giving you a hard time about that. Um, <laughs> I know. I know. This is also important because this would mark SpaceX's first true interplanetary mission, right? Um, true. I say true yeah. mission, right? There's some. Eh. Well, true interplanetary in 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 the fact that it's going to go to one of the eight recognized major planets. Yes, um, they are. They do have um the Psyche mission that that will be launching on the Falcon Heavy as well. Though that is not going to a planet. To a planet. It is going. It is. It is. You know, getting flung out to investigate things in the outer solar system. Yeah. Yeah. Is is that before this one or after this one? I believe Psyche is before. Before this one, okay. Yes. Gotcha. So Thanks. so it will be a big win for SpaceX to prove not only can we move things into low Earth orbit, I don't think anybody would contest that because look at the Starlinks that are up there, right? Um, but also that they can start hitting these interplanetary targets because historically, SpaceX hasn't done, I, I guess not even historically, until we get to Psyche, SpaceX just hasn't accomplished any true interplanetary deep space missions. And they've sort of focused on low Earth orbit, GTO, da 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 But this is a big deal for them because it's time for them to start proving out that their guidance and navigation can actually hit these targets, right? It, it it is, and and you know I think to some extent they they have shown that um, with, with some of the very precise things they've been able to do uh, with Falcon Heavy, specifically that STP two mission the last time the heavy flew, yep. which had to maneuver to multiple different precise orbits in, in Earth orbit, um, and they have the data from the first one which they flung out to what would if Mars would have, if they would have aligned it correctly, you know, a trans Mars injection burn. Um, but of course you, they weren't trying to hit Mars, so they didn't have yeah. to wait. For More Mars. paperwork um, involved if you try to do that. <laughs> oh, and launch windows, man, they'll get you every time. Um, <laughs> but, but, but yes, it, 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 it is a big deal. But, you know, I think the other thing is that it important, that is important to point out is that SpaceX after the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy got their certification levels to do these really, really complex and important scientific voyages for NASA, which, you know, aside from crew, crew, crew is more, it's kind of like yeah. crew, major, 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 major top tier science missions, right? Yep. And, and once they got both got that certification, I mean, they've just been winning the contracts left and right. They won the DART mission, the double asteroid redirect test mission to slam something into an asteroid. Not not even to slam something into an asteroid, to slam something into the moon of an asteroid. Um, and, and that is incredibly complex, you know, um, targeting on the part of the launch vehicle to be able to pull off. Um, so so yeah, I mean they've they've been they've been really winning these contracts quite a bit since the vehicles got their certifications. Yeah. So if we can, I mean, of course, this is big news. It's it's a big deal yeah. for SpaceX. Um, there's some questions about it. If we want to grab a couple questions real quick. Yeah, I was and, just looking at those. Yeah, I want to start with this one. Uh, Craig was asking, wasn't there a one billion dollar cost to beef up the Clipper? Like, if you wanted to launch the Clipper spacecraft on SLS. The vibrations or something like that means that they would have to make the clipper beefier, which was going to cost a stack of money. Can we talk about that for a little bit? Cer cer certainly, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because at a certain point in the design process for a mission, you really do need to lock in what launch vehicle you're going on, because that's exactly right. You have to, you have to account for all of those things. And SLS, you know, a lot of the vibrations are are understood from modeling. Like, you know, we we the Northrop has fired the solid rocket motors multiple times. Mm -hmm. uh, the core stage has been fired twice now, once at full duration. Those uh, RS twenty fives have been fired. So you you have all of that sort of computational data to use to build the model. But until you actually fly the rocket you know, and you get the ground truth. You know, tuning what your design for a mission is going to be can get a little complex. I know that was one of the hesitancy things there. You know, the solid rocket motors do provide a lot more vibration than just 27 liquid-fueled Merlin engines do, uh, right. just simply by their design and how they work. Um, so, so yeah, there there would definitely have been added costs to ensure that it was built to go on the SLS. And part of unshackling it from SLS was, you know, okay, if we don't need all of those things, now we optimize it for what the Falcon Heavy can do, right? And what we need to build it for for there. And maybe you have some space trade-offs between, you know, a gigantic seven meter diameter fairing that an SLS block 
you know, that an SLS science vessel could give you because you have yeah. to fit into a 5.2 diameter meter fairing for the Falcon. But, you know, you know that early on, you know what you're going for. So yeah, the earlier, you know, the vehicle, the less you end up having to design for all potential scenarios uh, on your launch on, on your vessel side. Gotcha. So I, I wonder, I, I'll toss this in. Um, choosing Falcon Heavy or any Falcon, because the fairings are the same size, right? Versus SLS, did they already have the spacecraft designed? Like, are they going to have to redesign it to fit into a much smaller fairing on the Falcon 9 or, or Falcon, Falcon Heavy? Or had they already designed the spacecraft to fit into either one? Like, do we know where, where, where they are in that process? They'd been hedging um, when they when they were still shackled to SLS. They they right. had hedged um, just a little bit to make sure that it would still fit inside a Falcon or an Atlas or at the time of Vulcan. Although I would wonder how much of a shot at this Vulcan actually had, given it won sixty percent of the uh, National Security Space Launch contracts. But they've already had to move the very first one from Vulcan to Atlas because Vulcan won't have flown enough times to receive the necessary low grade right. certification. So, you know, uh, given the given the sort of hiccups with that engine from the BE4's engine side of things uh, on Blue Origins, part of the deal for that, you know, there might have, there might honestly have been some hesitancy in in a um, in a Vulcan rocket. Yep. And then you have the weirdness of the Atlas using a Russian engine. And yes, it's not a military flight, but it's a government flight. And there are sanctions on using Russian engines and buying. Right. I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure ULA bid for it. And I'm sure it was, you know, and I, I am sure they made the best possible case for it. But I think at the end of the day, Falcon Heavy might honestly have been it. And, and from an energy standpoint, we know from documentation that leaked out of NASA that they were already looking at the Falcon Heavy in depth more than a year ago. Yeah. Gotcha. Let me grab some more of these questions. Let's see if we can get some more of the specific questions. Because here's a big one. Will the Falcon Heavy be used in its reused configuration or expendable configuration? I would, so they've released it and say, I would almost bet based on the mass characteristics of the mission and wanting to put as much possible Delta V into that and as much energy into that as possible, that this would be a fully expendable Falcon Heavy. Um, yeah, that, there's, a, there's a good super chat here from Thomas kind of saying, expen if, even with an expendable Falcon Heavy, Clipper would still need a gravity assist. So mm -hmm. I guess, I guess they've done the math perhaps and mm -hmm. that's which just it will it. um it, it will it will uh do a i i believe it's a it's an earth mars gravity assist is so launch it from here use mars to gravity assist it and get it to jupiter is i believe the trajectory plan if they launch in october of 24 spacex just wanted an excuse to get to go by mars real quick <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the, Thomas also asked, why not add a Star 48 or Caster kickstage so it can do a direct tra trajectory? Huh. Yeah, um, so that question. was something, yeah, that, and that was definitely something that was looked into it. I don't know if you want to take that one, Jack, since you grabbed the question, but I know no, they looked at no, it. No, please, I was just trying to tee it up for you. <laughs> oh, okay, um, so that so that was something they looked at and that they did consider both with um, the Falcon Heavy option and with the... Um, uh, SLS in, in its block one configuration with the integrate interim cryogenic propulsion stage. Um, it, those types of propulsion kick stages are really, really, really good when you need to go really, really fast to not slow down. Um, li like you're going to either slam into Mars's atmosphere and it's going to do the bulk of the slowdown, or you're going to go as fast as you possibly can because you want to be going as fast as you can when you get to Jupiter to slingshot around Jupiter to get to Pluto in nine years. Um, right. But the trick with uh, getting something like uh, with something like Europa Clipper is you can't accelerate it fast enough that its own engine then can't slow it down by the needed velocity to get captured into Jupiter's gravity well. Um, and a lot of times, even those really small star, you know, 40, star 38 motors can give you so much propulsive force that you could dispense with a gravity assist, 
but that's a different load dynamic and environment on the vehicle um, that you then need to account for and build for. And it's potentially more propellant. You then have to pack into Europa Clipper itself to then turn around and slow itself down once it gets there. Yeah. I, I wonder if part of the thinking there isn't, could you do a fully reusable Falcon Heavy and then make right. up the deficit because reusing a rocket, like the Falcons are the only ones that do it, but they lose a ton of performance if you want to land them. Like if you just run the engines dry and you use all the fuel to push yourselves under this trajectory on orbit to Jupiter, or whatever, um, you get a lot more performance out of an expendable Falcon Heavy or nine than you do when you have to save some of the fuel and stay slow enough to do the landings. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder if some people are thinking, could they do a kick stage and do a fully reusable Falcon Heavy, and then the kick stage makes up the difference and you end up with the same trajectory with the same flyby and that sort of stuff. But for the for the discount price of a hundred and whatever million dollars, <laughs> what is it, 178? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know? Nemo's not going to mind if we drop a Falcon or three Falcon stages <laughs> on his head, I guess, right? Like, it'll make a reef. It'll make a reef. <laughs> an artificial. It's a it's an interplanetary exactly. mission to Europa and an artificial reef installation. Well done, SpaceX. Hey, exactly. <laughs> um, yes. Um, the 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 answer to your question, Das, is why I very carefully said because you would have had to have designed the vehicle for those types of loads to begin right. with, right? And the and the added propellant. It's it's not that you couldn't do. A delta. It's not that you necessarily couldn't do a delta V trade-off. Right. It's that Clipper from the beginning wasn't really designed to be strapped to a solid rocket motor and fired out of Earth orbit. Um, right. In that in that way, it was always sort of designed with this idea of when it, well when it was shackled to SLS that it would have a liquid stage underneath it doing that. Um, well, technically a transmartian injection burn is yep. what they would go for. Yeah, this time around. Gotcha. Let's let's speed run a couple shorter questions here. Do we know how long Clipper's journey will be? Like with the Falcon Heavy sending it out there, the gravity assist, do we know how long it'll take to get to Jupiter? We do. Hang on one second for me on that. <laughs> That's why I asked Chris, because I figured Chris would know. <laughs> of course. Uh, Europa Clipper. Yes. Uh, Europa Clipper, if it launches in the October of 20, if it launches on October 10th, 2024, which is the opening of the Falcon Heavy's launch window, it will arrive on the 11th of April, 2030. So just on five and a half years, basically. Five and a half years. Five and a half years. No kidding. All right, yes. and that's how that's and... how big of a deal. Go ahead, Chris. Yes. Oh no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, that's but how big I, of a deal. I was going to say that's a serious vote of confidence in SpaceX because think about it. This isn't oh, we're trying to put up some Starlink satellites and they get to orbit or not, whatever. This is you spend years designing and building the spacecraft, and then you launch it, and then that thing has to fly through space. It's got a coast phase of multiple years before it even gets to its science mission. So choosing a rocket that you trust is actually going to get it there, that's a huge vote of confidence for SpaceX and, and the Falcon Heavy, right? Yeah. As, yeah. as <laughs> someone with mild anxiety, that terrifies me. Like anybody working on that mission at SpaceX, I, I, I'm sure they'll do a great job. They've done a great job at basically everything so far. Just look at their human space uh program, but also mm -hmm. something that would absolutely terrify me to work on to like have human lives on in your hands or like precious science data that we've been waiting so long for to, mm -hmm. to have that that's just mm -hmm. that's you know like it's a lot of responsibilities so like you said huge vote of confidence yeah and, we... and, and i would and i would just tweak that a little bit like huge vote of confidence in the falcon 9 as well because that's where most of that data comes from right like we, right. we call it a falcon yeah. heavy because of the first because of the three cores that are strapped together, but that second stage is what's responsible for doing that insertion burn at the correct accuracy levels um, to send it on it to send it on its way. And and that stage is a Falcon 9 second stage. So I mean yeah. a lot of vote of confidence in what that Merlin engine can do and what its accuracy can be. Yeah. yeah. So before here's we move another on, great oh, oh go, go for ahead. it. I was just gonna answer this one because it's sort of in the same vein to what Chris uh, G was just talking about. Is Falcon Heavy's able to use Falcon 9 boosters, or do they have their own manufacturing? I, it's the case that they can use Falcon, they can modify a Falcon 9 to be a side booster, right? So yes. it's basically the Falcon 9 side boosters are Falcon 9, or the Falcon Heavy side boosters are just Falcon 9s. So the center core is different, but the side boosters are just Falcon 9s that have been yes. slightly, you can put a nose cone on it, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah that theoretically, actually, it's just pop the interstage off of a Falcon 9 and put a nose cone on it, and it's a Falcon Heavy side core. Very Kerbal. That that yes. was my question that I was going to hop in with. Um, do we know 
are they going to use flight proven boosters or a core or are they going to build a brand new set of boosters and cores like is that designated in the award or anything like that reasonable versus or flight proven versus brand new so it would have been specified in in the contract and, and specifically what did spacex bid what did they put forward um you know they may have even put forward if you want a brand new one here's the price if you want right. one that's fully that where where it's using reused first stages here's the price um 178 million just so no, here's the thing with that launch cost. It includes all those little extras that NASA needs for big time science missions, right? Like the special handling of the vehicle, the, how, you, how you have to handle encapsulation, um, you know, all the, all the little added things that NASA is paying extra for that are more than just the rocket because the 178 million is the all in launch services fee that right. NASA is paying to SpaceX for everything. Um, that, 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 that just seems really, really low for a brand new Falcon Heavy. Um, I, what I would sort of wager is that what they most likely bid is the second stage is obviously new since they have to be built to new every time. Um, and they most likely bid a fully, re, fully reused first stage um, boosters and core with the caveat being if we still can't manage to recover any of the center cores, we'll build you a new one that's included in that price. But they gotcha. probably want to use ones that they've already had lying around and just, especially if they've got to throw them away on a fully expendable vehicle. Gotcha. Um, there's tons of questions. I mean, we could sit here and probably do an entire show about Europa Clipper and Falcon Heavy. I know that's a, an interesting topic because it's, a, like we said, a huge win for SpaceX and a huge vote of confidence in the rockets that they've built. But there's a lot of other topics to talk about. So if we missed your question there, we tried to get to some of them. We didn't get to all of them. Of course, uh, we appreciate you. Really quickly, some Super Chats. Morgan, thank you so much, says, uh, love the content. Keep up the work. Um, there's a question about Starship in there, Morgan. So I'm going to hold on to that till we get to Starship. But thank you for the support. A uh, Rough Rider show coming through as well. Rough Rider saying, what kind of payload modifications would Clipper need to have if it were to launch on SLS? I, the world may never know because it's not launching on SLS. <laughs> right? Can we leave it at that? There's something about vibrations and things like that. Uh, but I don't think we may ever know exactly what it would have needed to done because they're not going to design towards that. Right, y'all? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how else to answer that one. Um, let's see. And uh, Carlos, Carlos came through, and this is about next Friday's launch. We'll be talking about that coming up here, I think, uh, about tips to watch. Let's hang on to that. I'm going to put that one back in the queue. Carlos, appreciate the super chat there. I don't want to leave the super chats for too long, but we'll get to those topics that y'all were talking about. I'll leave it in the queue for then. Uh, next up in our topics here today... Out in West Texas, Jack, this is your ball to run with. How you want to tell us uh, about what it was like to see some folks go up to suborbit? Oh, you know, it's uh, just nerve-wracking like any other human spaceflight, but also uh, very cool. You know, it's a totally different experience than watching a satellite get launched or, or even a test flight uh, that's uncrewed. Um, it was... A really cool experience to get to watch the launch from about three miles away at Blue Origin's press hangar. They have a whole entire spot on their facility that they built out and they call it the press hangar. I don't know, maybe they used it for something else and they repurposed it, but it's definitely an odd choice for a press hangar given the, that the foreground isn't the, the most beautiful. I'll put it that way. It's sort of like a parking lot with some tanks and like disused tanks and things, not like a cool tank farm. Although, right. not like a cool tank farm. We did get a uh, a sweet hydrogen flare stack. Uh, it, we can actually see it in the in that image, that tower on yeah. the right hand side. Uh, that is a hydrogen flare stack. So that was kind of a cool thing. But um, but yeah, it was it was neat. We got to got to be at a Blue Origin launch from closer than I've been before, and they launched Jeff and Wally and Oliver and what is it, Mark, uh, into space. I, I love that. Uh, each each of the passengers has like a sort of a claim to fame, right? Like each, it's almost like a like a like Scooby Doo or something. Like where each character has like their their thing. Like oh, I wear an ascot. I have glasses. Uh, but no, seriously. Uh, but except Mark, which, who's just like I'm this guy's brother. But uh, but that was <laughs> kind of cool because like, he played what... like the every person, right? So it's like it it sort of worked out. 
Well, and like even on their call signs, because wasn't it Astro, Astro Bezos, Astro Wally, Astro Oliver, Demo Astro? <laughs> Like yeah, they didn't even guy, call him Mark. Like, <laughs> like, other yeah, guy, like, oh. yeah. <laughs> well, you can't have two oh, Bezos. So. What's his name? Yeah, like, like... Be- Bezos one and Bezos two. <laughs> <laughs> Although I any... see, I'd have laughed at that. I would have liked that. <laughs> Bezos one and Bezos two. <laughs> yeah. um, did anybody count the number of times they said astronaut in that entire produced webcast? Like astronaut Bezos, astronaut this, astronaut that. All right, astronauts. Like how Only... many times did they actually say astronaut? <laughs> Only like for the FAA to come out hours later and go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so someone should should cut the video, the live stream from them. You know, like where someone people do like a YouTube video where it's like B movie, but every time they, someone says B, it speeds up. Like someone should do that with the word astronaut and the Blue Origin broadcast. Oh, geez. So we got a we got a lot of shots here, and these are all photos that you took, right, Jack? Because you were out there. Um, yeah, it was a it was a really cool launch to to witness with my own two eyes, and uh, it. It went as New Shepard launches do, very rapidly, and yep. I'm I'm grumpy because I was once again thwarted by the first stage, uh, which I did not get eyes on until right before it landed. Like basically, when you hear the sonic boom from New it's Shepard coming back in, it's too late. Uh, yeah. You hear the sonic boom and look at the landing pad, and you will see a booster touching down precisely at that moment. And so, I got a few photos of that. I didn't post any of them. I don't think. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, and then uh, you know, a few minutes after the booster lands, here comes the capsule. Three main shoots, looking good. Uh, just drifting lazily into the West Texas desert, and unfortunately, again, with talking about that that funny, funny kind of press site situation. Uh, yeah. The the landing of the capsule was obscured by a building, so uh, that's why there no photos of it like touching down. But uh, either way, super cool to see a capsule under shoot. Um, I think that's only my second time having shot a capsule under parachute which is just special it's it's yeah. you know there's there's human lives aboard that that little nugget it's it's insane mm-hmm. yep um, and, and speaking of special you caught this one too right here i hope that's all in frame do we get that mostly in frame yes. oh pretty pretty close the ratio is a little bit different on that one but this shot jack you took this photo yeah i'm gonna try not to get misty eyed but uh here's what i'll say wally funk in the press conference and in this moment where they all gathered to take their photos with the booster and then Wally lingered just a moment longer after everybody else, Wally Funk, I'm going to try really hard not to get misty eyed. Wally Funk is an absolute legend. And not only is she a legend in experience and in her, her depth of knowledge, but also in her ability to be a human being. This is somebody who is pausing when everyone is rushing you along, everyone's running around like bees, there's press everywhere. Bezos and, and Mark and Oliver, you know, they've come, they've gotten their photos, they're done, they're leaving, they got other things to do, right? Wally is taking the moment in. And that was a really cool thing that I'm happy that I was able to grab because it's one of those moments where you look away for a second and you look back and your camera's not up to your eye and it's it's gone. And that was you know, that was a three second moment. In fact, mm-hmm. it's cropped as a square because off to the right is Oliver. So and I, I wanted this photo to be just about Wally. Um, yeah. And I could put out a version with Oliver, and that's kind of cool, like oldest and youngest. But, uh, but this this day and this photo was about to me Wally Funk and her mm-hmm. finally achieving a trip into space after so many years, after really deserving. I mean, nineteen thousand flight hours is utterly insane. I mean, I listen to like wow. I listen to the fighter pilot podcast, and they interview all kinds of fighter pilots and you hear a guy saying yeah i got like 3000 hours in an f18 and you're like wow 3000 hours like 19000 hours something like that for wally funk so um that's she's my got, she's got more hours in real aircraft than i have in kerbal space program that's hilarious i have a lot so, of hours in kerbal space program <laughs> it's a video so game. yeah that was <laughs> that was uh that was a, a really exceptionally meaningful photo for me to capture and i have a bunch more of wally like she's just so expressive that's kind of what i mean about she's good at being a human like when someone addresses her at the press conference she's wide-eyed and opening her mouth or raising her hands or blowing kisses or she's just very expressive and uh and just what an absolute joy what an absolute legend of a person and here's yeah, the whole I... crew you can see po- this is moments earlier posing with the booster a super cool moment i mean how surreal how surreal of an image is that you guys that's jeff bezos yeah. 
that's a photo I took of Jeff Bezos and others in front of a landed rocket in Texas. That's just wacky to me. That they wrote on. Like that yeah, they were that they on. Were, yeah, yeah, like what what reality is this? Somebody please pinch me. But uh, super like huge honor to be able to cover this event for NASA Space Flight and just be there. You know, it's one of those say what you will about the you know wealth disparity, which you know I'm, I hear you, and say what you will about you know the yep. question about questionable aspects of this, or if you want to question it, go for it. But this und- undisputably was a moment in history, along with. The Virgin Galactic flight a couple what is it a week and a half two weeks ago now and you yeah. know just it's just a cool a cool thing to have captured in terms of like space flight uh, history and one of the things Jeff said at the press conference which I gotta say it makes sense that he's the world's richest man because he can really he can really he talks the talk well um, I was a little bit wooed in the press conference I'm not gonna lie one of the things he said which he said before is we're right now in the barnstormer phase. If you think of rockets uh, like airplanes and the evolution of airplanes, we're basically like land it in a field and you know pay a guy five bucks and he'll take you up and fly you around. And obviously it's a lot more than five bucks, but five yeah. bucks was a lot more back then, yada, yada, yada. You get the point. P- <laughs> point being, this is early days and it's inspiring and exciting to recognize that this is early days and imagine what a 737 Starship would look like in the in the space world um and so yeah just a just a cool cool deal all around yeah chris you were jumping in a couple times there uh i know you have some thoughts on the whole shindig (laughs) yeah i mean it was what what i what i loved about most about the 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 new shepherd flight i mean jack I, i can't say it any better than you did about wally um i mean and 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 how meaningful that was and i mean just my 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 hat tip to you for that photograph that that was i mean that that was the shot and just wanted to say that and i also just say like what you were saying too about her ability to just be a human right is i don't think she ever managed to actually activate her own microphone during that flight but you could hear her in everyone else's everybody else's mic. loud and clear and i loved that and yeah as I mean, someone whose audio has been captured in other people's video uh myself like me screaming and hollering about something as i'm sure has happened to you too chris i can i identify with that deeply i, I feel seen yes. <laughs> yes exactly it's, i think at demo i think at demo too even though we were not standing anywhere close to one another you can hear me yelling in tim dodd's launch video yeah. um on that one but but you know but but like her excitement her enthusiasm you know like the fact that w- at least what the microphones picked up the first thing she said when she got out of the i mean also, she just got out of the capsule like she was a rock star, which she yeah. was, which I loved. Um, but like the first thing microphones picked her up saying was, you have to go. <laughs> and 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 I mean, and and that's what and, you know, that's what it is to me, because arguments and I think pedantic arguments about Ooh, what space and are they and are they astronauts, you know? I, yes, I understand why people are asking those questions. That's not this is about the overview effect. This is about the impact it has to look down on your home planet. And to what and what they all say is when you see it without a border, it's life-changing in terms oh, of how, what you come back with. And I don't care if they're considered astronauts. I don't care if they're considered passengers. I, that's not the point to me. The point is to get enough people up there to really start getting people to care about our planet and, you know, understand yeah. what those divisions are. And yeah, that that's what this is all about for me. Yeah. That's even, that's what Jeff has said in the press conference and many times previously. But I, I go back to, you know, saying I was surprisingly I, I surprised myself I, I was a little bit wooed by his words at the press conference i mean he he said a lot of the things that sometimes we might wish uh another rocket company ceo would say in a more eloquent eloquent way right like he says you know we're not trying to go to mars or escape the planet we're trying to make the planet better by going into space and by giving people that overview effect and we're trying to basically treat earth as a nature preserve and move heavy industry off planet so that we can keep this one jewel of a planet out of the eight or nine, however you want to go, uh, that we have. 
this is the good planet. Like we we can go to other planets and explore and etc. But this one is the good one, and we have to really take care of it. And once you go into space and you see it with that perspective, you will realize how fragile it is and how beautiful and special it is, and that we do need to take care of it. And you know that's something the world's rich, richest man saying is a good thing because he's got resources that can be spent on that sort of thing, uh, which I think he's now going to split his time between Blue Origin and the Bezos Earth Fund. And, you know, I I'm, I can be as cynical as an next person, but uh, at least at least he's talking the talk. You know, let's see if he walks the walk, but at least right, he's talking yeah. the talk. That, right, that's that's that, meaningful. Yeah, and, and that was one thing that, that, that I kind of thought there too, Jack, which is, you know, hearing him talk about that was, you know, like my, my sense coming out of that was, you know, like, those are good words. Now go do it. Yeah, like now yeah, my, seriously, my roommate, go do it. I was telling my roommate all this, and he's like, "Did they shoot you in the neck with a dart or something? Like, who are you? What are you?" Saying? <laughs> I was like, oh they, man, they you gave got you me. the overview effect by having yeah. you there to hear he's the like, words, right? Like, he's like, uh, <laughs> my roommate's like, "Just wait a couple of days. Wait a couple of days and see how you feel." But no, It'll it's true. It's, it's true. I, you're not wrong, us. You're really not wrong. I mean, that the press conference, Eric Berger, I think, called it a sham of a press conference because they only answered three softball questions and yeah. the rest of it was more of a ceremony. But it was at least, um, you know, informative to me as a reporter and photographer and someone commentating on all this stuff. You know, I don't think what Jeff was saying was bullcrap. I think he meant what he was saying. I mean, I have a, I have pictures of him holding back tears like it's you know it's meaningful that he said those things so let, let's see if he you know where that goes but yeah uh hopefully the new shepherd can do what they say they want it to do and lead to further technology on you know further use of that same technology on new glenn and uh new glenn this like new shepherd is basically new glenn's second stage and it is hydrolox which is great because all that the only exhaust that it makes is h2o which is water so, uh, you know, I am all for uh, seeing Blue Origin thrive and, and, and prosper and continue down the path that they've gone and, and build the road to no, – they always say build the road to space. None of you guys were there with me on the bus riding to the, to the landing pad. Um, but Was there a chant? It, it, was, just, it was just a straight road. Uh, I wish. <sighs> Don't get me started. There was just a straight road from the barn to the, the launch site. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to like elbow the person sitting next to me, like, so is this the road to space they built? Like, uh, but anyways, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh. Um, well, <laughs> this is, I mean, this You're is so one of those things that we could talk about forever, right? Uh, your your ruler map roads, where they just put a ruler on the map and just draw a straight line and build a road there. I mean, we could talk about astronauts and suborbital tourism and, and all these sorts of things. We do we need, do need to keep the show going here because we've got a lot of other stuff to talk about. I think I, I didn't make a lot of comments on that, but I, I want people to understand that the technology that's required to do this, to get three, four, five, however many people up above whatever line you want to draw and then safely back down and not only get the people safely back down, but also get the booster back down so that you can use it again. I know SpaceX has done, oh, we've already landed booster. We don't need anybody else to. But the more technology we work on like that, the better off we are. So if they can turn some of this around into their other programs, it's still useful progress, even if, oh, it's just an amusement park ride, right, for rich people. Well, the technology behind it is still pretty impressive to make it safe so that you can get it up there and get the booster back. So we didn't, and, we didn't really hit on that. Um, that's an important thing. And it, go ahead, Chris. And ten, and 10 seconds, 10 seconds, because I know we want to move on. Yeah, yeah. $28 million for charity. I, I and, don't ever want us to lose sight of that, because even though yeah. that person wasn't on there, and yes, that's a lot of money to pay for a seat for a five-minute ride, $28 million for STEM charities. I mean, STEAM charities, charities, really. And 19 different charities yeah. already got $1 million each of that. Yeah. I don't want it, I don't want people to lose sight of how much that matters to some really to some really good charities. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, it really does. Uh, it's 200 million to the Bazonian or whatever we're renaming it now. Um, oh, yeah. you know, the big, the <laughs> it was two, it was 200 million to Van Jones and 200 million to a chef whose name I'm yeah. I'm not going to try and pronounce. And that was you know it, it was uh it was clearly meant as an optics thing like to take the take the heat a little bit off of um, off of the flight and you know have a bit of a different news story than 
Oh, it was it was a hundred million 100 each. Million Sorry, hundred million each. My bad. Yeah, two, yeah, uh, two total, I think. But uh, yeah, either way, I'm all for you know giving courageous people money with which to make the world better. If you were the world's richest man and a hundred million dollars to you is like a cup of coffee to me, yes, please use that attempt to, to make it sure that money that you've hoarded and accumulated is used for good. That's a good thing. Buy lots of cups of coffee at a hundred million dollars each. <laughs> Um, let's, let's keep going here. Like I said, we could talk about that one forever. It's just one of those things. And you know, what's an astronaut? Where's the Carmen line? All those different things. None of those technical definitions are going to distract, detract from the experience of the people that took that ride, especially Wally oh. there, the joy on her face coming out there. I don't know if she cares what you call her one way or the other, because she got that experience. She's been waiting literally a I lifetime guarantee, for. I guarantee she, she doesn't she, care. Yeah. I guarantee you she doesn't care, but I will call her an astronaut. <laughs> there you an go, astronaut. Chris. <laughs> uh, and actually, just I know we're trying to move on, but uh, two things she said during the press conference that were really interesting to me was one, she didn't have enough room to do all the things she wanted, and that's with right. only four people out yes. of the plan, six total people on New Shepard. And two, she said uh, it was she wanted more time. It wasn't long enough. Yeah. So I wonder if she'll be flying on Dragon at any time soon. That'd be really cool if she did. But either way, it made me question being on Virgin Galactic or New Shepard and not having room to do the things that you want. Why not just fly on a parabolic plane and get way more time and way more space in zero G anyways, I'll just throw and that see, grenade into the room as we're yeah. trying to move on. No. And yeah. I want, and the first time someone flies on them both, I want their honest opinion on which one it was easier. Cause it looked to me like Virgin Galactic was slightly easier to move around in New, yeah. mirror. New Shepard, but I, uh, you know, <laughs> would like to see. Yeah. <laughs> it was I, I guarantee yes. you, <laughs> I guarantee you that both of those companies are going to help with the upsell. Somebody's going to fly on one of those suborbital flights <laughs> and they're going to say, I have to have more. I'm going to orbit. And then that's going to take business to SpaceX or wherever they can get it. Right. Yep. Um, I guarantee 100%. you that those suborbital flights are going to upsell some people. And that's exactly what we need. We need that to happen. We need more people paying to go to orbit so that it becomes more and more available and the price continues to come down and it becomes a real thing that people and companies or whatever can do. I, we're never going to move on. Something happened in Russia. What's going on in Russia? I'm just going <laughs> to forge ahead here. Uh, we're doing something with the space station, but trouble on the launch. Chris, what's going on? Well, I love how you segue to that, because ironically, Russia has little to do with this. Uh, that's a picture from Kazakhstan. Uh, oh. And then the rest of it was in orbit. Um, <laughs> no, um, sorry, I couldn't resist that bit. Ah, um, uh, yeah. Okay, so... A, a few things, and yes, I mean, I think the biggest thing to, to, to say right off the bat is yes, when Nauka got to orbit, it had some teething problems. Biggest thing to take away from that, it's on its way to the space station, its orbit is being raised, all the thrusters, all the engines are working, it's on its way to the ISS, and piers will be removed from the International Space Station to make room for it tomorrow morning. Um, in the 8 a.m. hour Eastern um, uh, East, Eastern uh, Daylight Time, so around noon UTC uh, tomorrow. So uh, all of that is to, 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 to preface what we're now about to talk about, <laughs> because, oh boy, um, man, I mean, if you want to talk about a launch decades in the making, boy, this was it. Uh, th this module, Nauka, began its construction in 1995. It was originally the backup for the very first module of the International Space Station, the Zarya Control Module, because if Zarya was launched, lost in a launch accident, Unity couldn't go up. Literally nothing else could go up until right. unless Zarya was there to go, you know, be mated to and, and start constructing out the space station. So this started as a backup to Zarya, and it was about 80% complete as a Zarya backup when Zarya successfully made it to orbit in November of 1998. And then they kind of had this weird, what do we do with it? Um, it's 80% it's complete. Surely we don't throw it away. Um, there was a bizarre idea that it would actually take the place of the U.S. Destiny module or a design based on it would take the place of Destiny because Boeing was late with the Destiny module, but that never came to fruition, even though a memorandum of understanding was signed. Um, but then basically they came up with this idea to say, um, OK, it's going to be the primary science module on the Russian side of the space station. And in 2004, they began reconfiguring it for that for an initial launch date of 2007. 
then nine, then 10, then 11, then 12, then 13, then 14, and all the way down about a year for year slip out to 2021 when it eventually lifted off. But it wasn't just that they needed to reconfigure it. They ended up finding problems with it. Uh, they found metal shavings in some of the propellant fuel lines leading to the thrusters and the engines that they eventually tracked uh, that they that had they had it had to go back to the manufacturing facility and be cleaned and then it came back and they're undergoing the launch preparations again and they look at the propellant tanks which again were built in the early 90s um and they looked at the propellant tanks which were actually a design going all the way back to the old soviet almaz space stations of the oh 60s. wow those are the, the military <laughs> space stations right the one, the one oh, they put yes. the cannon on Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Uh, oh my God, we could talk. We could spend an entire episode talking about old Soviet space stations. Um, but yeah, it actually goes back to all that. And then they found those same that same type of contamination in the propellant tanks. And I'm, this is leading to something. Um, this isn't just a trip down memory lane. Um, and they had a big quandary about what to do. Do they build new tanks? Well, that wasn't really an option because the factories and the machines that were used to build them literally didn't exist anymore. So that wasn't really an option. So they looked at taking old. They looked at taking tanks from the frigate um, upper. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm just being told breaking news: uh, the progress uh, undocking of the piers module has been delayed until Monday. Um, but still on track. But oh well. Um, uh, but anyway, um, so they couldn't just they couldn't just build new tanks. So they looked at taking frigate upper stage tanks and putting them on instead. But then they would have had to have completely redesigned those tanks, and that didn't really work. So eventually, they were just like, "Well, I think we just launch it as is." Um, because basically we don't think the contamination is enough to really affect the engines. And we actually think that the reason all of this contamination is there is a byproduct of building the tanks and how they're built. So if we just built new ones, the problem would, um, you know, the, pr the problem would just persist. So they launched as is with that contamination in the propellant tanks, knowing it was there and knowing that likely Zarya and Zvezda and the Mir modules also had that contamination in them as well. Well, we got to liftoff and oh, Proton launched fully successfully, got it into the correct orbit. And before they could get out of before and uh, when they passed out of communication range with uh, the Vostochny Cosmodrome, they had a lot of weird signal issues that they were dealing with. Antennas didn't look like uh, it just started raining massively here. That is probably um, yeah. my apologies it's, if that's what no, you are. It's, yeah. it's kind of the soothing. Months. I miss yeah, the but... rain. I, I miss the rain from Florida. It's like one of the only things yeah. from Florida that I miss. So please. The, uh, the the monsoon that's happening from the tropical system that's developing 200 miles off Daytona. It's always really comforting when your when your city is directly mentioned by the National Hurricane Center as the point of reference. Um, anyway, um, my apologies for that, but um, uh, they got into orbit. They had indications that antennas hadn't deployed properly, that thrusters weren't firing, that maybe there was a leak in some of the tanks, and you know, it. it a lot of us at NSF stayed really quiet when that was happening because the right. plan had, had always been that Anauka was going to have to communicate with the ground stations in Russia, which meant it, as soon as it left a range of Ostochny, it wasn't going to be heard from again for several, several hours. Um, they Because it, doesn't, it didn't need to talk upward to the tracking and data communication relay satellite from NASA or Russia's equivalent of that. So they didn't do it because it wasn't necessary. So that always meant that any type of information you got was going to be based on little bursts of data that you were getting as it was coming within range of the ground stations. So it wasn't all that surprising that it took as long as it did for them to really figure out what was going on and have the chance to work with it to get it into the configuration they needed to start raising its orbit. The orbit raises were late, but they started. They weren't able to use the main engine because a, a pressure equalization valve between the RCS propellant tanks and the main propellant tanks for the main engine opened prematurely and actually pushed the pressure in the tank for the main engine above its operating limit. So right. they basically had to use all the RCS thrusters to 
push enough propellant out of the tanks by burning it to raise the orbit um, in order to get the, pr the pressure down enough so that that main engine could be used. The main engine has been tested and used uh, a couple of times now. So Nauka is on its way to the station. Um, right. It's not it's not exactly what they were hoping for in terms of smooth sailing. But, you know, I think another, a lot of the reason that none of us really panicked or said a lot, too, is, you know, if you just give us Cosmos enough time, they can make it work. Um, and, and, I, and I think any of us who have followed Ross Cosmos for a while just kind of know, like, unless they've only got like 30 minutes because it's suborbital and it's coming back in. Like if, if they've got a couple days on orb with orbital stability, which they did with this one, just give them yep. a couple days. I mean, they'll brute, couple force, days. they'll brute force something here. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's on its way to the station. Piers's removal is, is now Monday as, as we just heard, um, you know, that the Kurs antenna was opened, right? This is one of their primary docking. Um, so there's still some issues and everything. You know, Katya has been great at um, at pushing out that information from her sources uh, and, and everything on what's been going on. But you and that's know, why I put it up. Uh, there's yes, nothing exactly. irreparable. Yeah. That's you were talking about that. That's why I put it up on the screen. So. Exactly. And, and, you know, like we've already seen, like, I uh, I know originally the plan was that the International Space Station was not going to reorient itself. Uh, Nauka was going to come up along the radial bar um, up. So if basically Space Station, Earth, Nauka <laughs> comes up like this, right? Um, but uh, because of all of these issues that they've been having, they're actually going to reorient the International Space Station so that Nauka can approach on the much easier to approach on velocity vector. Um, so, uh, the station will actually reorient when Nauka is ready. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, bumpy ride to start with, but it's on its way. And, and throughout all of it, all the sources from Katya and Roscosmos themselves have made a huge point of saying that everything inside the module, all of its internals, its oxygen systems, its life support systems, everything that is going up to augment and, and replace sometimes, because they left a lot of the original systems from Zarya on it because Zarya's systems are 22 years old. Let's have new ones. Um, but they made a point throughout all of this of saying everything inside of it is functioning well and perfectly. Right. So it's not the interior that's the problem. It's just the propulsion system, which has really given them issues. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> But that's is, the lowdown on Nauka. <laughs> yeah, that's the lowdown on Kazakhstan, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's So... So this is actually replacing a piece of the space station, right? We talked about undocking piers, and then the breaking news was that got boomed back by a day. Like, this is literally taking a mm -hmm. slot that's currently filled by something else? That's the better way to say it, is, is how you. I'd say it. Um, yes. Um, th the plan was always that piers would have to go away when um, uh, when Nauka was ready. Um, in, in fact, when Pierce was launched and attached to the station, I believe it was 2001 when Pierce was launched, uh, it was, I mean, as soon as Nauka got its launch date, it was like, okay, and then Pierce goes. Like, that was always sort of the plan because they needed Pierce as the airlock. Nauka will now be the airlock. You right. know, they ne they needed something as as they kept going. So the plan was always sort of that Pierce would be temporary. It was just much more permanent than they ever sort of envisioned it being to, to get it out to a 20 year service life when it was originally going to be about five to 10 under the original gotcha. plan. And so N Nauka is like a, is it right to call it a standalone module? Cause Piers was yes. not a standalone module. Piers was like, you have to attach this to the space station. It's not of any good by itself. Right. So when yeah. they undock Piers, it's going to reenter and burn up question mark. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Um, Burning up. About about three and a half hours after Progress MS-16 removes it from the space station, uh, it uh, Progress will fire its retro rockets to re-enter, and it will be destroyed over the Pacific. Um, and they're taking a little bit more precaution with this one because there are some heavier docking elements which can actually survive the heat of atmospheric reentry. So right. they are they are also going to publish where any debris will come down, and they already know the timing of any debris that makes it to the ocean will be in this range of time. Gotcha. Um, like, a, like a notice the mariners or something yes. like that, like we see for starship testing sometimes. Exactly, kind of. and they'll Not expose exactly. it over the ocean, like like they and they'll target it for over the ocean. Yes. Gotcha. Um, but but so yeah, that's... it would be okay to call it a, a standalone module because it it could technically support people by itself. Um, it's right. bringing up a lot of uh, life support equipment. Um, it's bringing up a lot of those things. So it's it's it, it is you know 
a standalone independent module if it absolutely needed to be, but that's not the plan. That's not the plan. Right. So it's, it's interesting. And this sort of goes into a question. We'll grab a couple questions real quick here, but we do need to keep going. Um, we've heard rumblings about Russia pulling out of the ISS, taking their toys and going home or whatever, however you want to term it. But here they're adding a new piece to the ISS. How does that, does this give any confidence that Russia is going to stay involved with the ISS? Is this like, well, what else do we have to do with it? We're just going to throw, send it up there. I mean, what does this say about potential future international relations and cooperation? Yeah, I, I, well, I'll add one more thing. There's one more module going up later this year. Uh, Nauka's not it. Um, the the prequel docking hub um, will be attached to the bottom of Nauka, um, right. and that will serve as the actual main docking EVA you know uh, lo location. Um, with Nauka ser serving as an interim place for when when needed. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think it. I I don't know if it gives Russia any more impetus to stay beyond their sort of stated desire to leave in 2025 um, because they made that knowing that Nauka was aiming for a liftoff in mid July here, which it met, um, uh, you know, it, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, the only thing that we can say for certain is that the only toy, because <laughs> I, I love how you said, take your toys and go home. Um, you know what I mean. Is that, <laughs> yes, no, I, I do. Um, is that the only the only things that they would take with them are the Soyuz and the Progress. Um, the, the, space the International Park. Space Station is not actually meant to be taken apart. Uh, you cannot just simply detach the Russian segment from the American segment, because the Russian segment has all the life support equipment kind of important uh <laughs> has all the propulsion kind of important um but that was baked into its design it was never meant to be disassembled once it was put together um okay. to any to any major degree so basically if russia were to leave in 2025 2026 2027 whatever and the u.s segment partners in isa canada japan um and axiom now decided to keep going with it uh, basically, Russia would have to transfer ownership of the Russian segment to the U.S. partners, and uh, that's how they would do it. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so which they have already said they will do. If we want to yeah. continue with it, they have said we'll find a way to transfer it. You know. Gotcha. Really quickly, um, has this ever happened with the space station before? Have they ever taken off a module the size of Piers and thrown it away? Like, no. I know that they've moved some docking adapters and stuff like that around, and they reconfigure on occasion, like they'll move some of the modules around, but have they ever taken a piece off that was a part this of the station the... and said, don't need it? This will be the first to be decommissioned. Yep. Just no. just yeah. imagine taking a room off your house and chucking it into the ocean or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, we don't need that. <laughs> let's, let's plug this new one in. Like, it's, it's they... wild. It this, really big, is. this is big hardware that we're talking about, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, rumpus yeah. room. More like jump room. <laughs> Get rid of this. Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. No, Piers will be the first to be decommissioned and removed. Yep. Okay. And in bringing Nauka up there, does that extend the life of the space station? Any? We hear like, oh, it's getting mm. old. It's, it's these the machinery, the life support, the connections, stuff like that, getting old. Are we replacing some of that? Could that extend the life of the station? This is a fantastic question, and I'm really glad it was asked. It could in many, many different ways. Um, they left a lot of some of the backups, not all, but they left a lot of backup systems that were originally on it in case it needed to function as a backup to Zarya. They left a lot of those on there. They've upgraded a lot of those, right? As the as it kept slipping, they were like, well, let's switch out the life support. Let's switch out the, you know, the living cord. Let's switch a lot of this stuff out. So yes, I mean, uh, launching this does provide a lot of redundancy uh, or added redundancy because the systems up there already have redundancy but it does it does provide some more options not a full sale oh my gosh if zarya went down we can just switch everything to nauka not that but right but but close yeah but pretty close okay um and then one more question sort of related uh jack i thought you shaved what happened what <laughs> That's so related. It grows it's back, man. Related. I was going to try to tie it into, like, are you visiting Russia shortly? Like, what's with the beard? But uh, a ton of people in chat are impressed with your ability to grow facial hair. Hey, what can you do? It just happens. <laughs> I can't grow it here, but I can grow it real well here. So <laughs> You need to go to space so the microgravity evens it out a little. I don't know if it works that way. Um, <laughs> 
in any way, y'all. Uh, let's keep going here. Chris, I, I'm trying to figure out exactly what the plan is. I know we're super oh, short on um, time. Just throw minutes. up Rocket Lab real quick. Throw yes. up Rocket Lab. Okay. Yes. Rocket Lab. You have All 60 right. seconds or some amount of time. I <laughs> promised Michael 90, so time me. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay. Um, so Rocket Lab uh, earlier this week also revealed that they have traced the source of the problem that led to the running out of toes, um, the loss of the running out of toes mission back on May 15th. Uh, basically, it was a, um, how did they describe this? It was a problem with the igniter that corrupted some of the communication signals between the engine and the computer that basically caused the engine gimbling system to go wow all the way over to one side the and the stage side. just started spinning. Um, this was apparently a very tricky thing to find seconds. and diagnose, but they did actually find it and were able to replicate it in the lab. So they are um, aiming to return to flight later uh, later this year, although they did not uh, specifically say when, just it would open later in July, but we're really late in July now, so we'll see. Um, the other major thing, but you can keep Rocket Lab up, is that um, Starliner uh, passed its flight readiness review for the Orbital Flight Test 2, so that will be aiming for a liftoff here on Friday, July 30th. Um, and there's the crew for the crew flight test, but Starliner passed its big thing, so we'll be uh, covering that all next week, and uh, of course, taking a lot of your questions after a successful launch on that. So that is Rocket Lab and Starliner updated for us. Look, I'm speedrunning the 10 images real to spare. quick. <laughs> Starliner, Starliner, Starliner. Yeah, Starliner rolling out. Starliner at the VIF. Starliner, etc. We're going to do an entire stream just for Starliners later this week. Starliner later this week, right? And yes. That oh, is multi seconds. multiple streams probably for Starliner later this week. Maybe yes. Okay. <laughs> Pencil Lots down. of Starliner going on. Um, but that brings us to everybody's favorite shiny stainless steel rocket down in Boca Chica. There's like 100 videos for me to play here. What are we? <laughs> <laughs> we just start playing videos. I don't know what you want me to do. Start right, with the one that went fiery. <laughs> okay, the fiery bit. Let's see here. I think I've got that. There we go. In right there. But man, Jack, a lot's happened this week, hasn't it, man? Yeah, this and in, in the last week or two, there's been several extremely large milestones, and one extremely large milestone and extremely large vehicle. As you can see right there is booster number three conducting the first ever static fire of a super heavy booster. So that is a historic moment in the Starship program. That was a three engine static fire and Elon tweeted shortly after that it was a good static fire. Um, they have since pulled those engines off of the booster. Curious as to what's going on there, but Elon also had tweeted shortly after the booster static fire that they might do a nine engine. <laughs> you're all right, Toss. You're good. Uh, <laughs> Switch to a static <laughs> picture. <laughs> <laughs> they might do a nine engine static fire of booster three, uh, depending on booster four readiness and progress. But I'm not quite sure why they've pulled those three engines off. Maybe they'll install an additional set of engines and those three are now qualified for use on booster four. Who knows? But that is just one of many huge and, you know, honestly, things that we've been waiting to see for a long time now are there's it's like dominoes they're starting to fall and uh if if you don't have anything to say on on the booster four or a booster three static fire let's go to the the payload bay because that thing is huge to me i mean i have <laughs> eighteen thousand things to show on the screen for sure but uh let's uh let's do the payload bay real quick because this is nutty well, uh, i got the thing <laughs> it's one of those things that we've been waiting to see in the same way that we've been wondering, you know, what is a starship with a full thermal protection heat shield look like? Uh, we've been, it's sort of probably you know, the latter two thirds. Um, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it. It's, it's just one of those things that we've been, like I said, waiting to see. And what does the payload bay of a cargo starship look like? And Elon tweeted a little, in response to Chris B, NASA Space Flight Actual, that this was a Pathfinder nose cone. That they, you know, presumably their production is uh, is significant enough that they are able to take some of these nose cones and they say, okay, maybe this one we're not going to use for flight. We're going to cut a notional payload bay into it and measure the forces on it, or at least just see what yeah. does it look like when yeah, we cut like that. It, you know, yeah, it looks like <laughs> look that, at the screen. Is, it's absolutely. <laughs> 
beautiful to see the inside <laughs> of that of that nose cone. And uh, on one of the shots, one of the photos, excellent ones that Mary took, you can, I just zoomed all the way in on the, like full resolution on the stringers. And you can see on the stringers, there's like a laser cut aft or forward and then a number. And it's just one, it's just a super cool photo that you can see so sharp, the detail like that. And two, it's just a little bit, a little window into, haha, get it, a little window into the Big construction window. of these things. Yeah, fine. Um, <laughs> so really, really interesting stuff with the with the payload bay there. Uh, uh, I was just on the, um, the Innerspace podcast yesterday. They had me on and they asked me, what did I think of the nose cone with the, with the hole cut out of it? I hadn't seen this yet. Uh, and I think I gave a completely wrong and horrible answer because holy cow, look at the, I mean, it's, it's clearly a payload bay. That's what Elon tweeted. Uh, yeah. it's, yeah. Know, it's, it's really cool to, well, and to you see. Can, and like, oh, zoom out for a second. Sorry. Sorry. Really, really quick. Wait, what? I, it's a video. I'm just playing a video. <laughs> oh, it's a video. Oh, I just thought you room, said, sorry. What do you want? That? <laughs> Is that good? Zoom no, 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 no. Sorry. To. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, I thought you had zoomed that on that. I forgot it was a video. Yeah. <laughs> Jack zoomed in on it like three days ago. <laughs> Two days ago. Yesterday, whatever. I no, I just love this because you can see the, the 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 feed line to the to the liquid oxygen header tank. The header tank, um, yeah. Uh, running up the side of that. Yeah. And and I also just love that you it's like you can see the little chalk strings where you just pull it back for the measurement and let it go <laughs> like of where, of where to cut but i love that sorry i didn't realize that was a video uh consciously so continue <laughs> it's okay i was uh yeah there's the zoom in with the numbers and stuff the forward and aft and stuff like that so yeah so cool so super yeah. cool uh but that's a definite progress and then why i was here watching this because i was i was running the robots uh for the 24 7 stream if you're not aware here on the channel we have a 24 7 stream live from boca chica and we've got folks that are sort of hanging out watching what's going on and zooming in on different things so i was there watching what they were doing with this nose cone i thought they were just going to move it or take it off a transporter or something like that and lo and behold they were decapitating it <laughs> Yes. Yep. Nose cone? So nose connotating it. I don't know what the right way to say that is, but uh, <laughs> denostro. De yeah, I don't know. De but denostrifying de it. I don't know. But look at this. But yeah, it's a. Uh, it's been scrapped. So I mean, I presume that's what that means. I mean, I think it means they they got what they wanted out of it, and now they're scrapping it. We'll have to see in the daily video today from Mary what uh, what the status of that is currently. But yeah, I mean, I love that's the time how it goes because you can see the little lift, and the lift is going like across yeah. it and then whoop, it's actually going to yeah. just lift the top off here in a second there we go yep and then it puts an egg in a big egg <laughs> yeah. um so that's uh, going on and, we know and, and i know elon said like like pathfinder right jack but i mean he also very specifically said like they they hadn't really nailed down how big that opening might be how big that door might be because i know yep. one thing when i saw it i was like oh i don't know why i kind of expected it to go up the, the the ogive like where it starts to curve for the um yes yes that exactly um yeah i wonder if that's a structural yeah. thing or obviously there's a header tank up there so um mm -hmm. uh, you know it would make sense that the header tank needs a certain amount of structure to be happy yeah for, for lack of a scientific <laughs> term um yeah it, it'll be really curious to see what exactly those payload bay doors look like and how big they are and this is the first time we've had any inkling into what that might look like and that's a, a really cool moment in the evolution mm. of starship it's it's got to survive the flip and burn i think is a huge thing so you can't just cut this big massive door in it and take no consideration into the forces that are during launch during flight yep. it's in orbit yep. it's re-entering and then right before it lands the flip and burn that it has to survive um you don't just cut a hole in the side and call it a day you have to make sure that it remains it contains structural integrity like when you close those doors is that going to help with the solidity, rigidity, I don't know, with the structural integrity of it? Um, have you created a big weakness in it? That's probably what SpaceX is looking through, trying to figure out how can we make these doors big enough so that they're useful, but in such a way that the rocket is still structurally sound going through all the different regimes, of, like flight regimes it has to go through, the maneuvers and stuff, the forces that it has to withstand, right? Yeah, remember the, the nose cone jail, the structural test stand for nose cones? It wouldn't mm -hmm. surprise me if the next time we see that in action, it is uh, when they have a nose cone with payload bay doors and they want to make sure 
uh, when those doors are closed and when it's all buttoned up, that it can withstand the stresses that it's going to be exer- that they're going to be exerted on it. Uh, yep. And now I'm panicking and thinking, do they take do they take the nose cone gel apart? I mean, I guess they could put it back together if they did. I can check either way for you real quick if you want. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. <laughs> I saw it still sitting there. Um, cool. Like okay, an hour cool. and twenty minutes ago. <laughs> all right. Cool. I uh, so yeah, that's that's a, that's one of those moments, and it wasn't specifically this week, I don't think, but we've also seen smaller body flaps body flaps with thermal protection tiles on them this week we've definitely seen all kinds of barrel sections with thermal protection tiles on them so that's yet another one of those like what is it going to look like how how long until type uh mm-hmm. type developments that we've you know that's now occurred we've seen a flap covered in tps tiles we've seen curved tiles we've seen a nose cone with payload bay doors we've seen a super heavy booster static fire and so all of these things and more are just sort of stacking up and making an orbital flight seem that much more imminent, which is super cool. Chris Law in chat saying, second, I want to spend a weekend in nose cone jail. You're you're crazy, Chris Law. I don't know. I saw that pop <laughs> I just, up. I had to read it out loud. <laughs> I just went ahead and brought up, I, I pointed a camera on the 24-7 stream at the nose cone jail, and then I brought up a copy of the 24-7 stream. Here Perfect. to show, so it's still there. It's still by the two starships that are Thunder Buddies out there. Now, now to third layer. Let's get a true. Uh, <laughs> let's get a recursive shot there, an infinity <laughs> shot. Uh, but okay. yeah, that's so, that's that's uh, kind of the main thing I wanted to hit on with Boca Chica. There's also, um, a, you know, a lot of other stuff going on in terms of construction around the orbital launch site, and uh, you know, work on various infrastructure. And here you can see. Uh, the booster getting its engines yanked out. So we'll have to see what happens to booster three in terms of Raptor engines. Um, yeah. And <laughs> here's a shot from danger cam of it. Just, yeah. just, a, it just, just, a, by. just a world's most powerful full flow stage combustion engine rolling by casually on a pickup truck. On a pickup truck. <laughs> yeah. I love that you actually put this in the video. Cause this is like, you know, I didn't yeah. catch it tracking on Mars cam, but you could just see this Raptor engine on a truck driving up highway four. And it's like, all right, we might as well toss that in the daily. That's cool. Oh, I like it. I like this <laughs> shot a, a lot cool shot, actually, yeah. just because it, I didn't even speed that one up too much or time lapse it or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but yeah, I just thought it was a cool, you know, it, it sort of helps some, you know, it helps me sort of have a lay of the land in my mind when you see it go this way and then turns the corner and then comes at you and then goes past you and, it kind of gives you like a mental map of where where the cameras are looking. I don't know. It's just I, I like that shot. Yeah. So a, a lot of things going on out there. Um, I think the big questions are probably going to be what's next. I mean, we've heard Elon talk about this nine engine static fire, but then they removed three of the engines. So it's not just adding six engines. It's adding all nine engines back. What are they going to do? They have that inventory there. We remember the, what was it? The fellowship of Raptors or whatever the tweet that Elon put out. I don't think I have that one queued up over here, but are we going to get another static fire off booster three work progresses on the orbital launch table? Like that seems to be a pretty safe bet that that work is going to continue. Um, The tower section continues to get stacked out there. We know we have right here is going to come up. uh, I don't know if we're calling it eight B or nine because eight was sort of half of a section. So is this the second part of eight or is this nine? I don't know. I think we labeled it nine, right? Yeah, we labeled labeled it nine. nine. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, what what's next? Are, are we going to get a test? Is the FAA going to bulldoze the tower? I mean, nah. No. I mean, that's a that's a good question in terms of what's next. Uh, who uh, it remains to be seen if we'll get more testing from Booster Three engine wise. But if I was a betting man, I would say at the very least they're going to test Booster Three um, in some additional way. There's been a couple different pieces of hardware that we've seen them building. One of which we could we've thought could potentially be for testing uh, the booster, sort of like a max Q test rig, sort of like a the nose cone jail situation, but instead for, for a booster, maybe not looking the same with the crossbars and everything, and like a cage, but oh, basically a way to tug on the booster and uh, make sure that it is going to survive flight forces. So maybe we'll see some more cryo-proofing type tests or destructive testing with it, or maybe they'll just cart it back to the launch site or sorry cart it back to the build site and scrap it and wheel yep. booster four out um it's, these pipe it's out here hammering uh <laughs> yellow piping together tubing sorry <laughs> yeah that thing I, I have no idea what that thing's gonna i gotta imagine it's gonna be part of the launch tower in some way but uh 
yeah, that's another one of the one of those things that we've seen pop up and just insanely rapid progress happen. And it's just like boop, 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 boop. every time you look at it, it's a little bit bigger. So just count down until uh, Frankencrane grabs that thing and hoists it up and <laughs> bolts it onto the tower somehow. I have no I mean, some people say maybe those are the catch arms. I, for some reason, I feel like the catch arms are going to have to be a lot more beefy than some tubes welded together. But I don't know anything about structural anything so maybe that this is plenty beefy or maybe this is something else entirely like a fueling arm or a, or a, just a thing to steady the entire stack or maybe it's like a little beanie cap like the shuttle hat i have you know i have no idea yeah. but whatever it is it's a uh, beefy enough to be worthy of i think trogdor perhaps Those yes huge definitely tubing so if, uh, <laughs> yeah if, if they put that thing on the tower right. it's definitely going to look like you know one of those like one big yeah, arm off the yes. side of the tower. <laughs> oh man, but I really would love to get a presentation from Elon on Starship. Um, it's been way way overdue, and there's so many bits and pieces and parts that we have no idea what we're looking at. Um, it would be really cool to just sort of have the current plan and current situation all laid out uh, for us to sort of grok. But grok. but yeah, nice. <laughs> Um, I guess the other news, because this question comes up a lot, and so what was it yesterday, uh, Chris, was it yesterday or this morning? Jeez, it all runs together. Chris had asked about Hubble. Didn't oh, Chris yes. ask Elon if they could rescue Hubble with the starship? Elon said Elon's sure. Elon's answer was sure, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I have the tweet queued up here, but I do have this infographic that was prepared. Um, I spent a lot of time yesterday <laughs> on the live stream... <laughs> Trying to draw Hubble fitting into the the payload bay, notional payload bay, and then we've got the diving, and then the flip and burn, and I mean, he did tweet sure though, right? Was this well? Was a, this all I the, know the... what goes in the store next. I mean, <laughs> the save Hubble campaign begins the with Das Art. Hubble. We should just put what? save Hubble on the bottom of it, and then that Das Art T-shirt. This was did on you... the twenty four seven stream. Yes, I can okay, tell yeah, it straight on I've... the twenty four seven stream. I missed this completely, and I'm really sad that <laughs> I, I did. I did too. <laughs> was it over twenty four hours ago? Can I go back and look at that? Oh, I uh, it was two thirty one yesterday, so it's just over twenty four hours. Yeah. It's like twenty six. Oh. hours. Well, twenty three at twenty five hours actually, because the time change. But uh, uh, I guess all the yeah. all the more reason to keep your eyes on Starbase uh, Live. You never hey, know Doss, when Doss we got is that. Gonna draw. We've got that tweet for you. In oh, you do. The channel in the now. Yeah, okay, cool. Well, I'm not sure that the tweet is nearly as exciting as this absolutely fantastic drawing, but I guess I'll bring it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> look at this. Look at the, the Sure. Okay. There you go. Because Chris actually asked them. Like, Chris B. actually asked, you know, thanks, Elon. Big roomy te telescopes with a twist. Could Starship return Hubble? And Elon just said, sure. Yeah. So, I think we're a little ways away. Luckily, the NASA NASA engineers got Hubble on the backup computer, so it's not ready to come home yet. Um, it's it's feeling better, and so uh, hopefully they're not up there trying to chompy chomp chomper a starship after it and bring it back down anytime soon. But Elon said, "Sure, it's it's a possibility." Not anytime soon, but yeah, I definitely you know like it, I th I think that provides some. <laughs> measure of hope <laughs> that i mean i mean i can't imagine that actual conversations have happened yet but i mean i also can't imagine that folks in nasa's you know telescope division and and the space telescope science institute aren't looking at this going please work the way we want it to right because <laughs> yeah. well the other thing that that has been talked about is just turning a starship into a massive space telescope like just yeah, use actually, the body of Starship yeah. as the telescope, oh, man. right? I, I need to get you a photo of it. I don't think I can do it quick enough for it to be relevant. But Sophia, <laughs> if you know what, do you know what Sophia yes. is? The flying, yeah, the flying the telescope. Flying. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. 747 that NASA has literally cut a huge hole out of the back of it and put a telescope in it on a giant freaking gimbal. It's the coolest, coolest thing. Um <laughs> And every once in a while, without the pandemic, when it comes to pl different places for its missions, they let people go see it. So it's sometimes yes. worthwhile keeping track of where it's going. Because sometimes yes, you get I've, lucky and get a tour. I have had the extreme pleasure of being on Sophia, and it is an amazing aircraft. And it's just the science, the science done in uh, in a vehicle like that is just so cool. You got to love the rarities and the wacky things. And the so yes, please Starship with giant giant space telescope i would i, I would love that i got you uh oh 
Uh -oh. Are you drawing? Are you drawing? <laughs> He's drawing. He's drawing. Big way. <laughs> no, I got you. Look. So imagine, <laughs> if you will, you put a big hinge on the nose cone. <laughs> yep. Yep. And I've had to remove the forward flaps. It's still a concept. Um, but what if you just hinge the nose cone out of the way and the whole body, you know, fuel tanks aside, was just a big telescope? I like it. I'm in. That's a All that's right. a light bucket for you. That's a big old light bucket. Elon, like it. And, and sign us up even... if you need any technical drawings of yeah. this. You're welcome to use this. It's a, it just looks fantastic. What a good idea. Well, and and I think what you just <laughs> said is like, is like kind of in, interesting because Elon was on on a kick a couple of weeks ago, um, where uh, where where our, this question was, uh, you know, where you know we were talking about different things about starships, and I asked him, can you? make a starship that is the satellite, right? Instead of buying the satellite to put in the starship and flinging yep. a satellite out to Uranus and Neptune, can the instruments just be mounted and you open something on starship? And he sort of continued beyond that talking about, you know, well, there are different variants they're looking at, not just cargo, not just crew, not just lunar, but deep space versions of starships that never come back, you know, and could telescopes be, I mean, like, yeah, this is, Perfect the one singular design, and this thing could really be a whole bunch of other things for us. Yeah, yeah. if they're, if they're yeah. churning out a thousand of them a year, some of them can just be a bus, right? And and not a bus, like a school bus, <laughs> but a bus is in like a satellite <gasps> bus. Yeah. Make a the system. magic school bus and take us oh. to the solar system, Here please. we go. <laughs> oh, Miss Frizzle, please. Yes. Let's, uh, let's grab some questions here real quick, because theoretically we have two minutes left. Um, you'll know how that always goes. Uh, let's see. Any word on hot gas thruster testing? We know that Elon said they weren't going to use it because it was unnecessary complexity. Have we seen or heard anything about hot gas thrusters? I don't think so. Didn't, I thought we saw some the other week, right? We, we saw some, and that's what sort of precipitated the conversation. And then Elon saying, no, no, no we were just like, he said that they weren't so, going to use it because there were unnecessary complexity for the orbital flight test, I think. I think. Yes, I think they so might that's have what tested them ask. once. Yeah. I, don't know, yeah. I don't know if they've tested them or not, if I'm mistaken there. But I think they tested them. Um, and I, you know, who knows if they'll test them again. We've seen them fire up RCS thrusters and stuff in their testing windows while they're waiting for a cryo proof or waiting for a static fire or after yeah. either of those things. So they could, yeah. I don't think there's, we have any specific plan knowledge of plans of theirs to do so. Yeah. And I think unless I misunderstood it, he was just saying they wouldn't be on the orbital flight, but they're still right. part of the design for everything else. Correct. Yeah. 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 There's okay. sort of like yeah. minimum, minimum yes. viable booster functionality with it. So you don't need mm. them. Yeah. They're, they're not required for the orbital flight test that they're working towards. Um, do we know how many Raptors are on site? We saw that picture with the Fellowship of the Raptors that Elon tweeted out. Uh, but every single, I can answer this one, every single day the Raptor count changes because yeah. there's a Raptor van that goes back and forth. And mm -hmm. earlier today we saw some Raptors get unloaded and I think we saw a Raptor or two. I don't know what we actually ended with there, but I think they loaded some more back up again. Um, yep. So every that's, single that's day the Raptor common. count is changing, right? Yeah, so keep your eyes uh, open on the channel for the daily video that's going to go up in a little bit when it's done getting edited. Uh, that will have that action in it from Mary, of course. And uh, that's uh, it's always super cool to see the Raptors come and go. And it's the the rate with which that, that has increased is another piece of the puzzle to, to getting to orbit, right? And yep. They definitely have a bunch of Raptors on site. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, so so can I, can I spoil the daily video? Like, if you'd like to know how many Raptors changed today, watch the daily video, or can we just say it was three? <laughs> oh, you, just said it was, you just said it was three, so. Oh, no. Uh, no. Apparently, <laughs> but no, apparently. if you want to see all the, if you want to see all the details, uh, uh, were they from Booster 3? I don't know. Watch the daily video. But it points, Watch the daily video to find out. <laughs> <laughs> point being, uh, Raptor count changes dramatically and yeah it's 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 cool because it's what you it's what we're going to see if they're going to put 33 or 29 or some number of engines on these vehicles they're going to need a lot of engines so we need to see a lot of engines getting delivered yep um a couple other things i'm going to speed around some of these y'all because we're right up on the end of the show here uh are they scrapping a gse we know that they've had some potential issues with gse we saw them sort of stop working on the gse and then right now out at the olp the orbital launch site um ols olp whichever um we see that they're trying to reinforce some of them it looks like so that's also yep. on the 24 7 stream i've had beach cam over there all day because there's multiple lifts up around like they're reinforcing those ground service tanks the big tanks that will hold the propellant on the ground over near the orbital launch set so did they find some design flaw or, or 
failing or something like that, something they needed to reinforce. Um, not sure exactly what happened, but they are modifying those GSE tanks. We've seen them hold some off. We've even seen them send one to the scrap pile. So they're continuing to work on that. We're going to keep watching what's going on because it seems like the orbital launch platform, the table, the tower, the GSE tanks that hold enough propellant for a starship to make it, if not all the way to orbit, really close to orbit, all of those things are important for this cadence that's marching towards the orbital flight test, right? So that's why we're watching that every single day. Like Jack said, the daily videos will keep you up to date there. Just pay attention. It may be one thing to be like, oh, oh they're stacking Booster 4, oh, they're stacking S in, or, or Ship 20 or whatever. But I think the real thing to watch is the work progressing over at the orbital launch pad because that's something that seems critical to actually get to orbit. Paperwork, FAA, everything else aside, they need to phys physically finish that infrastructure, right? Yeah, you have to build um, the launch pad in order to launch the thing off the launch pad, which yeah. sounds redundant, but it's true. And a uh, really good shot also yesterday in the daily of the reinforcement work going on mm -hmm. on those tanks. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I and it makes sense. That that's the thing to watch. It makes sense that, that it's been a little bit, right, uh, before they wheeled more tanks out or whatever. In context, now that we've seen them sort of reinforcing those, it's like they took the cryo shells that we know are going to go over the top of the tanks, but didn't put them over the top of any of the tanks. And so we're like, well, what's going on? And they scrapped tank four. And so, yeah, maybe they, like you said, they caught some kind of issue and like, yeah. oh, we, we built these to Starship standards, but a Starship is right now essentially disposable. And this really needs to be the kind of thing where we can cycle over and over and over and over and over yeah. and over. So they need to reinforce that, make them a little bit beefier than they otherwise w yeah. thought if they could. If I had to guess, like if like I had that. to guess, um, right now a starship, anytime it gets cryo liquids in it, the pad's clear, right? But the OLP, the 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 GSE over at the orbital pad can't be that way. The public road runs right to the beach within meters of those. That's tanks. a really good point. Really good and point. And there's mm -hmm. work progressing all around, so it's not like anytime you load those tanks up, you can clear the pad. They're supposed to hold propellant for days for a launch, or or even longer than that, right? So Very I wonder. If Sometimes you never some... unfill them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They have yeah, like to be the safe. sphere, right? Yep, 24-7, people around them. It's not pad clear. They have to be right there next to the road. That's where they've built them, at least. So I wonder if they didn't run into some design considerations that said, wow, that's not just a Starship tank. That has to be safe 24-7. People there are not differing levels. It can be full. It can be half full. It can be almost empty. Across the board, that tank has to be safe, and we have to, we have to tweak the design a little bit so that uh, we can put them right there next to the road and we can keep people around them. I, I would guess, I don't know that that's an official answer, but if I had to guess, that's probably why we've seen them sort of stepping back and saying, whoa, changes the GSE. Um, but GSE definitely, I think, in the critical path, right? I hope it is. 100%. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, there's, other, there's other questions in here. Chris, off the top of your head, do you know how big the payload volume of a shuttle is compared to a Starship? Mm. I don't know that one off the top of my head. <laughs> Uh, oh, in terms of the volume, yeah. no, um, shuttle could take roughly 32,000 or 16 metric tons to orbit in its payload bay when it was going to the International Space Station. Right. It could take a, could take a little bit more than that to, uh, if it went due east, but the volume of the payload bay, I do not 60, know that off the top of my 60 head. Feet, 60 feet long by 15 feet in diameter. I'm trying to find the volume yeah. here. Yeah, times nine meters would be. But then, but it wasn't. But it wasn't fully square. It was rounded. Yeah. 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 I'm, yeah. I'm frantically googling over here. I'm frantically googling. <laughs> I, I I just saw the question there. I I certainly didn't know that yeah. one off the top of my head. But maybe that's a cool stat to look up. It, maybe it is. I don't think I ever saw the shuttle described in terms of the volume of the payload, yeah. but in terms of the mass of the payload it could take to different orbits. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Everything I'm finding is all about the mass. It's all yeah. about. I mean, because of course with Delta V and and rockets, it's all a mass problem, right? So yeah. it makes sense that it would be framed in that way. But just because we've constantly heard Elon saying, uh, you know, right. a thousand, a thousand uh, cubic meters for Starship, a thousand cubic meters, a thousand cub cubic meters. So uh, somebody, somebody do the math and, uh, and, yeah. and tweet and tweet at me about it, please. We'll, we'll hold on curious. that one. And some tweets would be nice. Show your work, though. If you if you want to claim a number, show your work. Say where you and got include it the shuttle Just person. Work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> include the shuttle person. I'm, um, let me I'm being told a quick math is roughly one third that of Starship, but I don't. I have, I have not done the math myself. Roughly, okay, roughly one third. Well, um, actually, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, did you I see how see this that. is? The show is supposed to end, and then we ask that question: that Starship, <laughs> everybody's favorite Starship, and shuttle as well, and then we're just done. 
We're just, uh, <laughs> um, let me do this really quickly here. Uh, y'all, Super Chats came in. One reason we're able to keep the show going and do all the different things we do, whether they're remote cameras or Mary out in the field getting daily videos or, or whatever it is, the different types of coverage, or even articles that we write, all the different ways that we share what's going on in space and space news with you is because of y'all support. So uh, thanks to the people with the Super Chats here. Morgan was a new member. Appreciate you, Morgan. We've got a Musical Wolves. <laughs> says, four massive cranes around Super Heavy to act like a lightning tower. <laughs> Why would you need four? Jeez. Um, Musical Wolves, we appreciate the support there. Andy Spicer says, I'm so used to your voices. It's really weird to hear those voices coming out of your actual faces. Thanks, Andy. Uh, we appreciate you saying great stuff as always. <laughs> Thanks for the support. Musical Wolves, I saw the other ones in there. I would love to interview Wally. Uh, let me know if we get that worked out. Chris, I don't know if you know some people to send some messages to, but, uh, you know, if, if, if Wally's open for interviews, I'm sure that we would be happy to have her on the show, right? Oh, my oh gosh. My God. Yes. That, would be, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, We'd barely get to space because I'd want to ask her about all the other things she's done. <laughs> exactly, right? I, I will do this one because Carlos uh, asked this earlier and I said that I would come back to it. Any tips on places to watch next Friday's launch? Of course, talking about the launch uh, OFT2 of the Starliner. Um, Chris, what do you think is going to be a good place to watch if you're in Cape Canaveral? Uh, any public viewing sites that you could get a good view there? Time of day, yeah, so yeah, so two two things I would first say to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if you want to be able to see the rocket on the pad as it lifts off, right? See the initial plumes going everywhere, you're going to need to be in Titusville. Um, Max Brewer Bridge, the river in Titusville, any of the parks that are there, that's where you'll want to be, simply because the two beach locations, you cannot see the launch pad uh, from them. Uh, it sort of comes up and over, or you can't see the base of the rocket. So if you want to see the ignition, if you want to see the flash, you got to be in Titusville, which is about 10 to 13 miles away distance. from the pad. It's yeah, a distance. It's a long yeah. way away. Yeah, it's a distance. So um, uh, the other place, definitely uh, Jetty uh, park, Cocoa Beach, down near those directions. Um, uh, lots of parking. You'll be able to see it as it arcs away from us. Um, yep. And you're noticing that I'm not really saying Playa Linda because here's the big caveat with Playa Linda. It's going northeast. Mm -hmm. It's a crew capsule and it has solid rocket boosters. I do not know right now and cannot say with any degree of certainty whether Playa Linda will be open or not. If it yeah. is, if it is, it will open around 6 o'clock in the morning. You get there at 6 o'clock in the morning. You bring all the food and potential supplies that you need for, for the all entirety day. of the day. There'll be Lots a line. Water. There, there, will be a the, line there will be a line. The gate. There will be yeah. a line of cars to get in the yes. gate if Fly Island is open. Don't know if it's open. Yes. So you yeah. get there ahead of its opening at 6 because when they reach capacity, they close. And yep. it's one out, one in. Um, you bring all the water. You bring all the food. You bring all the stuff that you need for that day. There are bathrooms. Yeah. Uh, but yes, um, uh, but yeah, Playa Linda, you're going to be want, wanting to watch. I mean, our accounts will tweet it out because we'll get the closure notices. But the issue with Playa Linda is sometimes that road leading to it closes right at right. the base of the Max Brewer Bridge. So then you can't get there. And it's safety sometimes for crew missions. So right. we'll, we'll be paying attention to that. But it's going to be dicey. Also, too, weather, because it's launching just before 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And oh boy, it's basically that's, monsoon season right yeah, now. That's in rain Florida, shower time, so, right? That's yeah. rain rain o'clock. Yeah. So you either hope you thread that needle or yeah, we might be waiting till August fifth to try it again if they're not off the ground on the thirtieth. But th those yeah. are the places I would say to go for. Yes. If if you don't want to see it like while it's on the pad, but you just want to see the plume, because the SRBs are going to leave a plume, yes. right? It's it's a crazy yeah. thing. It's an amazing thing to see. Uh, going over to Rusty's at the port, yes, where we have our yes. fleet cam. Schedule your lunch so you're sitting on the deck, you know, weather willing and stuff like that. And uh, you may be able to be sitting outside having a beer or having some some food or something like that when the launch happens. And you just sort of sit back and <sighs> see the pillar of smoke go, and then you're like, all right, that's awesome. Back to lunch. Um, that's yeah, a, that's you know, a way to have lunch. Go there for dinner afterward. 
there you go. <laughs> that is a way more chill way to to watch the launch. If you're not, yep. if the hardcore like take everything you need and get ready to be there all day and got to get there at six a.m. If that if that does not sound appealing to you, which for yep. some reason it's appealing to us, right? As rocket <laughs> photographers and chasers, there's something wrong with our brains. But if that's not your vibe, yeah, just go to Rusty's, have a snack, watch it, watch it launch, get back to your snack, have a mark, do what you do your thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, hey, also check out KSE VC, the K- Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. I don't know yes. if they're back in to offer viewing opportunities. They, they are. I, so okay. be on the lookout for them, their website, uh, this, the Visitors Complex. If you look at Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex, that'll take you to their website where they tell you, oh, here's the different options. Those are paid I... options. But they may have some options there too, right? I, be- I believe I even saw the Banana Creek viewing site, uh, which would put you five kilometers from pad A, seven kilometers wow. from the pad that the Atlas is going from, yeah. uh, is was being offered sort of tentatively. So look, yeah, because they're back to offering viewing. Yeah. yeah. And say hello to Atlantis. If you go to KSCVC, say hello to Atlantis. Uh, Chris Bergen telling us not to forget Atlantis there. But we are, as usual, <laughs> way over <laughs> our time frame. And that's a bummer for me because I canceled some family plans today so that I could do this. And now I'm late. So uh, always want to answer the questions, especially if you're trying to get out and, and see a launch in person. We want to try and help you out there. If you can't make it to the Cape, we'll, of course, be streaming it. So right here on the channel. Make sure you toss a follow, turn on the notifications, Twitter, at NASA Space Flight, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let us do the housekeeping really quickly here. And if I miss some Super Chats and stuff, I appreciate you. Um, across the board, however you're supporting us, thank you. Whether you're liking things, you're t- retweeting things, you bought some merch or something like that, you're on the forums, whatever it is, however you are involved, we appreciate the support, especially for our members as well. The members are definitely a good way to be involved. And that font continues to get, interestingly, smaller and smaller, but not filling up the space. Uh, Yeah. We'll talk to Michael (laughs) about that. Um, Anyways, members, those are the launch directors and flight engineers. Oh, it just refreshed. Whoa. Cool. Whoa. Well, that's why. Did Michael say something? Um, anyways, members, we know that you don't get like a little pop-up in chat or anything like that, but we appreciate you as well. Um, the monthly support is a massive thing for us to be able to enter into new commitments and continue to improve our game when it comes to covering space for you. But, uh, for today, Jack, Chris, on both sides of me here, we had Jack Beyer. Jack, thank you so much for joining us. Yep. Thanks, everybody, for all the support, enabling us to do cool things like cover Boca Chica 24-7, cover things like New Shepard out in the middle of nowhere, and just, gosh, what a fun and amazing time in spaceflight with so much going on that we can't even take a breath. Yep. Yep. Y'all follow Jack on Twitter at, at the Jack Buyer, right? The Jack is the Jack Buyer, right? Yep. Remember when you I couldn't say my right. last name right? The, those days seem so long Hello. ago now. I think the thing is I could always say your name right. I just didn't know the right way to say your name. So that's <laughs> like I was okay. capable put... of pronouncing it. Point being, it's been a, it's been a good run so far. You're a little oh, wow. over a year now doing this stuff, and it's always a blast. Yep. So thanks, everybody, for watching. It's it's fun to not do this and be just talking into a void. It's fun to have an audience that we get to participate with in our Discord and uh, yep. chat with on Twitter and in the YouTube chat and everybody. So. Yeah, just... the 24/7 stream has been like a chat room for us. Like, yeah, the NSF people will stop through on occasion and just offer up opinions and talk with the people that are hanging out. It's almost like a space nerd, like an ambient audio video of Starship space nerd chat room. You know? Yeah, that's so... kind of what I've what I've been doing every time I I poke over there to see what's going on because I do frequently multiple times throughout the day what's going on in Starbase and I'll look at it and I'll just you know throw I'll answer some questions in chat or I'll throw yeah. a couple a couple uh, you know emoji in chat and just have a good time for a little bit when I have a few moments. It's always just, it's like the, it's like the hardcore, uh, you know, super, super group doing that stuff there in the, in the, in the Starbase live channel. So definitely yeah. go check out Starbase live. Yep. Absolutely. And then also Chris Gebhardt over this way, Chris, thanks for joining us today. Always, always, always fun. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Always fun to, to recap everything that's going on. It helps us keep on our toes knowing everything that's going on uh, yeah, right. each week. These shows really do prepping for them. But yeah, um, I, I am really looking forward to a, a whole bunch of awesome Starliner activity this week uh, leading up to the launch on Friday. So definitely be ready for a Starliner extravaganza this week. Yes. Yeah. 
All right. And uh, you can find Chris over on Twitter at Chris G underscore NSF. And then lastly here, I am John Galloway. You may know me as DOS, right? But uh, I am John Galloway over here. I'm K Space Academy on Twitter, always tweeting out wacky things. Uh, I've been doing, having a lot of fun with time lapses and stuff like that because we have so much video coming out of Boca Chica these days. So, Sped up uh, video you... is not a time lapse. Don't at me. Actually, Jack, that I that video is comprised of independent photos that are put together into a video. Sir. Sir. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I'm, I'm zipping my lips. I'm zipping my lips. I'm just saying, sir. Uh, anyways. <laughs> hey, what, there's a $50 super chat that came in as well I, the, on the Woo! way out. Chris Law, thank you so much oh, for the wow. $50 there, space coffee. We appreciate you. But that is going to be the end of our show, NSF Live today. Uh, I am going to try to run to get to my commitment. <laughs> Everyone else, whatever you're doing, run over to Starbase Live 24-7 and continue to hang out. But for now, we're going to go ahead and shut things down. Chris, Jack, appreciate you as always. And we will see you nerds later. Thanks for watching, y'all. Yikes. You bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these.